Tower of Babel has the Empire of Sodom. Now all the earth continued to be of one language and one set of words. And it came about that in their journeying eastward they eventually discovered a valley plain in the land of Shinar, and they took up dwelling there, and they began to say, each one to the other, Come on, let us make bricks and bake them with the burning process. So brick served as stone for them, but bitumen served as mortar for them. They now said, Come on, let us build ourselves a city and also a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a celebrated name for ourselves, for fear we may be scattered over all the surface. And Jehovah proceeded to go down to see the city and the tower that the sons of men had built. After that Jehovah said, Look, they are one people and there is one language for them all. And this is what they start to do. Why, now there is nothing that they may have in mind to do that will be unattainable for them. Come now, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not listen to one another's language. Accordingly Jehovah scattered them from there over all the surface of the earth, and they gradually left off building the city. That is why its name was called Babel, because there Jehovah had confused the language of all the earth, and Jehovah had scattered them from there over all the surface. The problem is, first of all, that this narrative is not a single event in time and space. It is an historical summary of a very long and complex social, religious, and political development. The city and tower are factors to a mindset towards building a civilization with monuments dedicated to polytheist cults. There were many temples, pyramids, and several ziggurats built before the famous et Menenki ziggurat built in Babylon. It very, it, it is very questionable which one are the oldest. Archaeologists claim that Tepe Sialk, located in Isfahan province, Iran, is the oldest. The Ainu ziggurat and White Temple of Uruk seem to be the next oldest. However, they seem to believe that these ziggurats are older than the pyramids of Giza. Since they are obviously mistaken, it is possible to postulate that the Etmenenki ziggurat, also known as the Tower of Babel, preceded all the other ziggurats in Mesopotamia. And the Egyptian pyramids preceded all the Mesopotamian ziggurats. An example of an extensive and massive ziggurat is the Marduk ziggurat, or Etmenenki, of ancient Babylon. Unfortunately, not much of even the base is left of this massive structure. Yet archaeological findings and historical accounts put this tower at seven multicolored tiers, topped with a temple of exquisite proportions. The temple is thought to have been painted and maintained an in indigo color, matching the tops of the tiers. It is known that there were three staircases leading to the temple, two of which side flanked were thought to have only ascended half the ziggurat's height. At Menemki, the name for the structure is Sumerian and means the foundation of heaven and earth. The date of its original construction is unknown, which with suggested dates ranging from the 14th to the 9th century BC, with textual evidence suggesting it existed in the second millennium. The resulting political developments were climaxed by Nimrod, who built an empire. The ancient Arabs knew him as Nimrod, which is the name on a monument dedicated to Sargon of Akkad. Sargon is the historical name of Nimrod, who is Hamitic, like the Canaanites who occupied much of Palestine. And he began his conquest from Akkad, a Semitic territory in Mesopotamia which shows that the sons of Cush, although were Hermetic, nothing distinguished them from the Semitic peoples and languages, whereas the Sumerians' territory of southern Mesopotamia were the descendants of Cain. 
Sumerian being a completely different language, linguistic family related to pre-dynastic Egyptians, Dravidians, and Ento. And the sons of Kush, Seba, and Havla, and Sabta, and Rama, and Sabtika, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Kush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Jehovah, wherefore it is said, like Nimrod a mighty hunter before Jehovah, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalner, in the land of Shina. Out of that land he went forth into Assyria, and builded Nineveh, and Rehobothai, and Kala, and Resen between Nineveh and Kala, the same as the... In regards to language, there seems to be a contradiction. This narrative in the early part of chapter 11 of Genesis says, all the earth continued to be of one language and of one set of words. Although in chapter 10 verses 5, 20, and 31, it describes all the descendants of Noah according to their tongues. These verses that identifies the nations according to their tongues is making a statement after the fact. It is a statement after they have grown into many nations and after the confusion of languages at Babel. Possibly, the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Noah once shared a common language before the Great Flood. Since Noah spoke the language of the antediluvian world, and it was only from him that the narrated, po narrated post-Diluvian families descended, why would there be different languages from children of the same family of Noah's sons? It is because this is a narrative written by the patriarch Shem, not by Noah. He was also affected by the confusion or the change of languages. The archaeological record does show that the Sumerian lang cuneiform script was the lingua franca of international trade, as English is today. However, during the Akkadian Empire, there was a necessity for syllabaries to provide bilingual vocabularies between Sumerian and other languages. Does this mean that before the Akkadian Empire, Everyone wrote and spoke the Sumerian language, or a common antediluvian language. Previously, there was no need for syllabaries. For example, in the book Archaeological History of the Ancient Middle East by Jack Finnegan, 1979, in page 43, first paragraph, Ebla is now identified with Tel Marik in north, north Syria, where a library of 15,000 cuneiform tablets has been brought to light. Most of these are written in the Sumerian script, but in a language now called Eblaite, that is a dialect of West Semitic, and that is related to the Biblical Hebrew number of syllabaries provide bilingual vocabularies in Sumerian and Eblaite. In this picture there's another example. Sumero-Akkadian cuneiform syllabary, Sisera 2200 BC. In the text, the archaic cuneiform script was adopted by the Akkadian Empire from the 23rd century BC. The Akkadian language being Semitic, its structure was completely different from the Sumerian. There was no way to use the Sumerian writing system as such, and the Akkadians found a practical solution in writing their language phonetically, using the corresponding Sumerian phonetic signs. In regards to the time when the Sargon dynasty and empire was destroyed, communication fell into disarray similar to the confusion at the Tower of Babel. However, it was during an invasion of barbarians as a punishment sent by their gods. 
What is notable also is that the empire fell into disarray and there was no cultural or political progress at all during the reign of the Gaussian barbarians. The possibility that God had literally changed the languages of mankind is a matter of further investigation. As coinciding with the event occurring during the Gaussian barbarian invasion. In the following section, quotes from two books will describe the details of that empire and of its destruction. The Archaeological History of the Ancient Middle East by Jack Finnegan, as I quoted before, and the Cambridge Ancient History, 3rd edition, Volume 1, Part 2. Sargon of Akkad at the point where the Sumerian king list introduces Sargon, the text is not entirely clear, and it appears to be said that either he or his father was a gardener. The so-called legend of Sargon, available only in New Babylonian and New Assyrian fragments, elaborates the account to the effect that his father was unknown, that his mother was a changeling, presumably referring to some kind of alteration in social, religious, or national status, that she put him in the river in a basket of rushes, cf. Exodus 2, 110, only that it must be a common practice in those days equivalent to people putting their baby at someone's doorstep these days, and that Aki, a drawer of water, lifted him out, reared him as his son, and made him his gardener. The king list says further that Sargon served as cupbearer to Ozababa and that he was the king of Akkad who built Akkad. Ozababa was also famous, according to a later text, for having given his name to a musical instrument. Evidently Sargon broke away from the service of Ozababa, was somehow able to establish his own kingship, built his own capital city, meanwhile assuming the name by which we know him, Sargon, meaning the legitimate king. Dynasty of Akkad The legend of Sargon describes his conquests in broad terms, to the effect that he not only ruled the black-headed people but also scaled the upper and lower ranges, circled the sea lands three times, and captured Dilmun. The mountains were perhaps in the northeast and the northwest, Dilmun in the Persian Gulf, and the sea lands the so-called Sealand Kingdom on the Gulf. Other texts make it possible to follow Sargon's conquests in more exact detail. From Akkad he marched against Uruk and overthrew the powerful Lugalza GC, who claimed the kingship of the land, that is, of Sumer, a historical inscription, probably written soon after the time of the dynasty of Akkad, describes the victory. Sargon, king of Akkad, defeated Uruk and tore down its wall. In the battle with the inhabitants of Uruk he was victorious. Lugalza GC, king of Uruk, he captured in this battle, he brought him and a dog Gola to the gate of Enlil. The gate of Enlil would have been at Nipa, the special city of Enlil, and the presentation at that place of the captured Lugalza GC to the chief god of the Sumerians showed that the rule had now passed to Sargon. With respect to Sumerian religious tradition, Sargon also installed his own daughter, Enhudanana, as high priestess of the moon god at Dur. On a carved disc from her, she wears a long flounced robe and conducts an offering ceremony, yet she was also devoted to Inanna and wrote in Sumerian along him an exaltation of this goddess. After establishing himself firmly in Sumer and Akkad, Sargon moved against Amaru in the west, Elam in the east, and Sabatu in the north. The same historical inscription just quoted makes him victorious in 34 campaigns. He went to Tuchel, hit, on the Euphrates, 200 kilometers above Babylon, prayed there to Dargan, chief god of the western Semites, well known in the Rath Shamra texts and among the Philistines, Judge 16:23, etc. Dargan gave him the upper region, including Mary another 200 kilometers up the Euphrates, and other cities, and as far as the cedar forest the Aminus in Lebanon, and the silver mountain the Taurus. He caused ships from Tilman, Dilman, 
and other places to Mur-Akkad, thus he controlled the shipping of the Persian Gulf. Another inscription calls him the subjugator of Elam, a chronicle, in a late Babylonian copy, and two Oman texts mention his wars in Sabatu. A stella, showing his soldiers taking captives, was found at Susa, a magnificent bronze head, found in a rubbish heap at Nineveh, is thought to be Sargon himself. Old Akkadian tablets found at Gasa, Yorgan Teep, 20 kilometers southwest of Kirkuk, the later Nuzi of the Hurrians, show the commercial activities of this one small city extending over considerable portions of this far-flung empire of Sargon. The earlier years of his rule may have been devoted to providing himself with a capital city, for all the sources describe how he built this in a new place, but in doing so he too committed some act which the jealous god took as an impiety. For he is said to have dug out earth from Babylon for the purpose of building a city next to Agade, and to have called this city Babylon. The incident is related in two chronicles in an omen, but its purport is hardly clear. It means perhaps that Sargon is accused by these late records of ambitiously attempting to make for himself a capital which should have the prestige enjoyed by Babylon in subsequent ages, and regarded by them as immemorial. Rimush and Manishtashu, the younger and older sons respectively of Sargon, and his successors in turn, faced revolts. Rimush fought against Kaku, king of Ur, and the warriors of many cities of Sumer. Manishtashu speaks of rebellion by all the countries his father had left him. Across the lower sea, Manishtashu made an expedition in ships. In the north, he left an inscription at Asher and is said by Shamshi Adadai to have built a temple at Nineveh. Eventually both sons died in revolts at home. Omen texts describe Rimush as the one whom his servants killed with their tablets, clay tablets used as weapons, and Manishtashu is the one whom his palace killed. Niram Sin, son of Manishtashu and grandson of Sargon, emulated his famous grandfather in the conquests and went beyond him in the titles he assumed, the divine Niram Sin, the mighty, the god of Akkad, king of the four quarters, for the first time in Mesopotamia, the determinative of divinity is found with the name of a king, the custom was followed by all kings of the third dynasty of Ur except the first, the kings of Izan, and by a few others. But otherwise, in contrast with Egypt, it did not prevail here. Likewise, the claim to universal dominion, expressed in the words King of the Four Quarters is new. Shalji and following kings of the Third Dynasty of Ur made the same claim. Garupon Enlil brought Gudium down from the mountain, and this uncontrollable people covered the earth in vast numbers like locusts. Communication were disrupted, cities struck down, agriculture ruined, and famine and death prevailed. Finally some of the great gods uttered a curse upon Akkad, evidently to the end that this city might suffer a worse fate than it had inflicted upon Nippur. Thus would Enlil be satisfied and the rest of the land be saved. So Akkad became an uninhabitable ruin, on its canal boats tow paths, no one walks among the wild goats and darting snakes. Akkad is destroyed, compare with prophecy in Isaiah 13 19 22, Rev 18, 2. A year in the reign of Shankalasheri, who is also named a year when he undertook a campaign against Gutium, which presumably reflects a counter-military action of some success. But the pressure of the Gushans is unmistakable and is illustrated, for example, in a letter from a farm owner of the time of Shankalasheri to his representative insisting that the latter proceed with cultivation in spite of the danger and, if the Gushans attack, bring the cattle into town for security. Post-Akkadian, Gushan, period like Rimush and Manishtashu, Shankalasheri evidently died by assassination, for an omen text speaks of him, too, as one whom his servants killed their tablets, after him. The Sumerian king list tasks, who was king, who was not king it is evident that after Sharkalasheri, anarchy and Gudium domination prevailed, and the time, usually put at somewhat over a century, down to the third dynasty of Ur, may be called the post-Akkadian or Gushan period, 2230-2112.
My intention is to establish a historical correspondence to the biblical narrative of the Tower of Babel. By this, I hope to establish the true meaning of what is the foundation for the proper identity, prophetic domination, and destruction of Babylon the Great. First of all, Babylon was purely a political empire. Sargon, Nimrod, built the first credible military empire. Please note, in those days, there was no such thing as a separation of religion, church, and state. The designation of Babylon the Great was made by Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, chapter 40, verse, verse 30. Chapter 4, verse 30. Because it was a great empire, not an insignificant city. The only significant reason that Babylon figures so prominently so prominent in the biblical prophecy is because God used Babylon in 607 BC to destroy Jerusalem, the temple, and destroy the sovereignty of his covenant people as captives in a foreign pagan land. Likewise, also when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and, and the temple in 70 CE, what remained of his covenant people was held captive by an even greater Babylon, even to this present day, by a foreign pagan nation. So the so-called Holy Roman Catholic Church is not the woman of his covenant people, but rather a foreign pagan political military empire. Babylon has now become a harlot by claiming to be in a covenant with God, with the God of Israel. The woman that has a kingdom, dominion over the kings of the earth. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked on the roof of the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is this not Babylon the Great, that I myself have built as a royal residence by my mighty power for the honor of my majesty? The Protestant Christians are now in control of the current world powers, especially by means of the British and its former colony, the United States of America also known as the Anglo-American World Powers. It was seen Protestant churches as well as Roman Catholics fit the image of Babylon the Great. However, most Christians who think they have heeded the call to get out of her, Babylon, as in Revelation chapter 18 verse 4, blindly overlook the devil in the, the, devil in the details, namely it is the Freemasons who are in control of all the Christian churches, both Protestant and Catholic. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and its waters were dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. This is the most significant scripture to identify the sign for the fall of Babylon the Great. This scripture can be interpreted in many different ways and has been, so my interpretation will be just another one. The Euphrates River was a lifeline of commerce and trade for the city of Babylon. Although the city was fortified with very high and thick walls, the Medo-Persians devised a way to cut off the flow of water to the city and thereby enter into the city under the waterway. They then succeeded, successfully invaded the city and conquered it. What this means for the prophetic Babylon the Great is the same. The lifeline of its economy and defense will be subverted or undermined. This lifeline is the US dollar as the standard world trade currency and the corporations who support its 
credit and treasury bonds. When support and confidence for the U.S. dollar dries up, the dollar standard will be abandoned. The kings of the earth, possibly China and Russia, will supplant the USA as the leaders and eventually destroy the USA along with her allies, namely Britain and Israel. It is that simple. It is as simple as that. No date for the end time is needed.